Hi guys, welcome to another John video. Um, it's going to be John 12, um, chapter 12, verse 12, all the way to the end. Uh, so just enjoy the video and I'll see you afterwards. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Praise God! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. God bless the King of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and rode on it, just as the scripture says. Do not be afraid, city of Zion. Here comes your king, riding on a young donkey. His disciples did not understand this at the time, but when Jesus had been raised to glory, they remembered that the scripture said this about him, and that they had done this for him. The people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from death had reported what had happened. That was why the crowd met him because they heard he had performed this miracle. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, we are not succeeding at all. Look, the whole world is following him. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. And the two of them went and told Jesus. The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I'm telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am, and my father will honor anyone who serves me. Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me. But that is why I came. So that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. It is not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. Our Lord tells us that the Messiah will live forever. How then can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? The 
light will be among you a little longer. Continue on your way while you have the light, so that the darkness will not come upon you. For the one who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Believe in the light then while you have it, so that you will be the people of the light. After Jesus said this, he went off and hid himself from them. Even though he had performed all these miracles in their presence, they did not believe in him, so that what the prophet Isaiah had said might come true. Lord, who believed the message we told? To whom did the Lord reveal his power? And so they were not able to believe because Isaiah also said, God has blinded their eyes and closed their minds so that their eyes would not see and their minds would not understand and they would not turn to me, says God, for me to heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Even then, many of the Jewish authorities believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not talk about it openly so as not to be expelled from the synagogue. They loved human approval rather than the approval of God. Jesus said in a loud voice, Whoever believes in me believes not only in me, but also in him who sent me. Whoever sees me sees also him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. If people hear my message and do not obey it, I will not judge them. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. This is true because I have not spoken on my own authority. But the Father who sent me has commanded me what I must say and speak. And I know that his command brings eternal life. What I say then is what the Father has told me to say. So yeah, really interesting. Um it's the whole Jesus story here, like, you know, the whole bit where he rides into Jerusalem, um, such a pivotal moment in his life. Sorry if I'm rushing this a bit, I've just recorded all of the John video, which is about 20 minutes, and I realised the camera wasn't on, which is ridiculous, but bear with me, so I'm going to do it again. Um, so verses 12 to 20, this is the triumphant ride into Jerusalem. Jesus is riding a donkey, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 which is literally your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. So he's fulfilling this amazing prophecy written hundreds of years ago um, and totally fulfilling it. But what I've learned about this, there is an odd undertone to this passage. The leaves they were laying down were actually like a symbol of like Jewish uh, nationalism and they were shouting Hosanna, which meant save now. So it's a possibility, so I'm not sure if this is true, and maybe they were just really excited to see Jesus and um, as their saviour. But what, I, what possibly could have happened is um, the people were actually thinking he was a political leader more than anything else. Um, someone, you know, that would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, challenge the Romans, perhaps even build an army to overthrow them. Um, once again, they think that, I think they were thinking in the natural, so they were there waving these branches saying, you know, he saved us. This is going to be the guy that's going to lead us out of the affliction of the Romans, rather than this is the guy that's going to take away the sin of the world. I don't think they were there yet. I think these guys were think, probably thinking of him more as a political leader. But we do this sort of thing all the time, and that's the reason why I do think it's probably the political leader kind of theory, because we do it all the time. We think of the situations and circumstances that we're in all as coincidence or orchestrated by us, we always think in the natural and not in the supernatural. So these guys, um, 
would probably, you know, waving those leaves, shouting Hosanna, hoping that he would overthrow the Romans, because that's like a natural thing, a natural response, a natural king. But really, he was a supernatural king. He would overthrow sin, death, and hell, rather than just the Romans. Um, it's also interesting how large the crowd was there as well. It was a massive crowd, and this must have been from the raising of Lazarus. Um, the people there must have been told about it or seen it. They must have thought, you know, if he can raise from the dead, surely he can overthrow Rome. And that's what I think they were probably thinking at that time. But amazing how the prophecy was still fulfilled. Um, verses 20 to 24, this is when the Greeks come up. So Greeks go up to him. Um, Jesus doesn't acknowledge them as much as his disciples. Um, but I mean, how much more is he going to acknowledge them after he dies? You know, we're technically Greeks. We are Gentiles. Um, and he's made a way for us to go to heaven. Uh, so it's, he acknowledges us, you know, to the utmost now. Um, but also notice, you know, Jesus said the time has not yet come a few chapters ago. Here he says, now the time has come. So imagine the anxiety and the pain that Jesus must have been going through right now. He was just about to do it. You know, he was just about to go through with his crucifixion. He knows the time is now. Think about that and think about that he could have stopped it at any point, but he didn't. Interesting, 24 to 26, a little parable type thing. Jesus is saying that a seed needs to die to be buried, you know, for it to bring life. You know, he's drawing a comparison here between planting a seed and his own death. So he's saying that a seed needs to die and be buried, which is Jesus, in order to bring life, which is Jesus. So I quite like that analogy. Um, he now calls us as well to disregard our life as well. Um, and in the King James, I think it says that we must hate our lives. And ob obviously that's not, you know, not showering or washing and getting fat and lazy and doing nothing. Um, it's actually saying that we shouldn't pursue our earthly and worldly desires above our need to glorify Christ and to spread the gospel and to live our Christian lives. We shouldn't be glorifying our desires and dreams more than that. Because um, that's technically hating our lives, if that makes sense. Because he's saying that we... We should sort of disregard our lives in that sense. Um, so yeah, we should hold them loosely is what I was trying to get at. We should hold all of our dreams and hopes and aspirations loosely if they're of the earthly stuff. So a good job, good car, whatever, good house. Hold it loosely because in comparison to those dreams, we should be really wanting to spread the gospel and to glorify Jesus as much as possible. Um, 27 to 28, this is a profound statement the cross that cast a shadow over jesus his whole ministry and his life would now become his reality this is what he came to do although it was so troubling for him and part of him wanted to be saved from it the cross out of love for us and for you and for me he knew he had to do it it's amazing love he could have done gone through the crucifixion but just had no pain but no he went through with it entirely 100% realistically, the, all the pain, all the grief, all the shame, all the anguish, and he still did it. And at any point, you could have lessened any of it, but he didn't. And it's just amazing because he did it for you and he did it for me. Um, just to fulfill that sacrifice, it's incredible. Uh, so 28 to 30, really interesting one. This is like an audible voice from heaven. The people described it almost like thunder. It was actually for all the onlookers rather than for Jesus. God rarely speaks audibly to people in the Bible, but he chose this time to speak. And to be honest, I don't know why. Um, I'm not sure, but it must have been something they really needed to hear and understand and remember. 31 to 36. So Jesus now plainly states that, that um, he's going to die. Basically, what will happen? Excuse me. Satan will be cast out as a ruler of the world and Jesus will reign. He will be lifted up in two ways. Physically lifted up to be glorified on the cross and metaphorically lifted up as well. Uh, so the Jews responded by saying that they thought the Messiah wouldn't die and they didn't understand what the Son of Man meant. Now this is really interesting because it just shows that the people there, the common Jewish folk, read about the triumph and the Me Messiah, um, the triumph of the Messiah more than his suffering. So their view was that he would basically be a political leader or basically, you know, they made up their own form of the Messiah by primarily reading passages about his kingship and his ruling and his triumph and ignoring passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah, Isaiah 53, which is uh, which talks of his great suffering. 
So they, he said, you know, I'm going to have to suffer. And they basically went, what? Why are you going to have to suffer? But they knew, they really knew about all of his kingship and all of the fact that he was going to be a leader or a ruler. So what I kind of thought about their mindset here, and I believe we do the same thing in our church, it, not our church, but in, in, um, in all churches, and generally in church life, uh, we sort of pick and choose bits of God's character to emphasise. So we kind of pick and choose scripture to make God fit with what we want um, him to be. So some preachers and churches will only preach on parts of the Bible that are about love, comparison, uh, love, compassion, sorry, and grace and mercy and kindness, you know, painting this false image of God to the congregation. But some churches and preachers um, will only teach about wrath and holiness and judgment and sin and hell. Both are not showing a rounded view of Jesus. Much like the Jews at the time of Jesus, they did not have a rounded view of him. They just thought, going to be the king, going to conquer. But really, Jesus thought, actually, now I'm going to have to suffer and die. You know, you need to read these passages as well and have a rounded view of your Messiah. That's exactly what we need to do as well, guys. Loads of loads of us err on the side of, oh, he's really loving and kind and merciful, which is true. But some of us are on the side of, no, he's really wrathful and you've got to do right things and he'll cast you out. And all these, all these things. We need to come in the middle and have a really rounded view. Um, yes, he's loving, but yes, he's um, wrathful as well. Yes, he's um, kind, but he's also uh, in, instigates justice as well. So we do need to have those two sides have a rounded view of the gospel. Otherwise, we'll get like these these Jews that saw Jesus and thought, great, political leader. They had no idea that he would save the entire world from their sins. Um, yeah, something to bear in mind there. 37 to 41, this answers the question, if Jesus was so great, you know, why, did ev why didn't everyone believe him then? <clears throat> it kind of answers that question. And I believe it's, it's because some people there were like us. You know, they were stubborn, they were arrogant, sceptical, they were pessimistic, they were selfish. All these attributes lead to a hardening of the heart, which is really difficult to explain. But the only way I could say it is almost like if you have a habitual sin, a sin that you do all the time, and you don't repent for it, and it goes on for years and years and years, and you're walking in this sin all the time. I believe God will harden your heart to the point where you don't even think it's wrong anymore, if that makes sense. You, you're not convicted of it anymore. And that's kind of Jesus saying, okay, you're not going to listen to me. Have it. You know, it, he gives you that desire. And that desire can be bad. I think that's what he did to some of these Jews here. They were so um, hell-bent on wanting him to die and disproving his messiahship when he fulfilled every single one of these prophecies when he raised people from the dead they still thought no i think god said okay if you don't think that then i'm going to harden your heart towards it and i'm not going to let you think it basically um which could be wrong but it's, it's, it's a bit of a theory but i do think hardening your heart is actually so dangerous um it's just when you sort of habitually walk in one sin or a couple of sins um, that you do all the time, you'll slowly get hardened to it. So you think, actually, it's not even wrong. And then you try and justify it. And, and then, uh, yeah, it just leads down a really slippery slope. And I think you've always got that opportunity to repent from that sin, that specific habitual sin that you might be walking in, and turn round from it and trust Jesus again. He will always, always forgive. And he'll always um, give you the power to overcome it. Um, but these guys, I think, did exactly the same thing. These guys were just like, no, I, I'm not going to do it didn't turn to Jesus and Jesus God went okay I will harden your heart towards it then we'll give you the desire of it so yeah very dangerous position uh, but we do it all the time don't we we, we do these things and, and, and God I think hardens, hardens some people's hearts towards some sins but um, always search your heart with fear and trembling if there's a sin that you keep doing change you know God will give you the power to turn from that sin and stop walking in that habitual way otherwise it will become so ingrained that your heart will be hardened towards it. Um, 42 to 50, this, this first bit is very interesting. Some of the Pharisees believed, and you know, remember what we were saying um, in the other chapters, how like, <laughs> not terrible, but how, how kind of doubtful the Pharisees were, and they were so set in their ways, and some of these guys believed, and that's an amazing in itself. Some of them put the pieces together, you know, they had that revelation from God, that Jesus was truly the man they'd been reading about. They must have been reading about him since they were born. Um, but they were private about it, which is interesting. And it leads us to an interesting question, which is, can you be private about your faith? Is it possible to be a secret follower of Jesus? 
personally in this country i think it's it should be temporary um a secret following of jesus i believe the the secrecy will cancel out the belief or the belief will cancel out the secrecy and what i mean by that is that if you believe enough if you really really believe it your secrecy will be cancelled out you'll you'll be burning with the passion to just tell people the gospel and um and the other way around so your uh, secrecy if you're so secret about it you'll end up you end up stopping believing not not believing it um i do think that's the case i th- think you've got to be passionate about it you've got to speak out about the gospel and stand up for the faith i don't think you can be secret about your faith in this country to the point where you don't tell anyone you keep it to yourself um i think there's really something lacking if if you are doing that and um i just yeah, pray for you. If you are doing that, I, I pray that you will get the power and the passion and the fire to be able to speak out about God and say and stand up for your faith and tell people the gospel. Um, because some of these Pharisees believed, um, but a lot of them kept it secret. But like I said, I think they will change. I think this, the belief will cancel out the secrecy. Uh, 44 to 50 is an amazing little mini sermon that God, Jesus kind of, he, he goes through, um, I tell you, he said uh, he cried out and said, so these are the last words in John's gospel from Jesus to the public. In this last speech to the multitude, Jesus emphasised the themes of John, of what we were talking about, his main themes that he was preaching on. Um, so he says, he who sees me sees him who sent me. So that's Jesus stressing his unity with God the Father. He then says, I have come as light into the world. And that's Jesus stressing his own truthfulness and the need that man has to follow Jesus. And then he says, I do not judge him. So Jesus stressed his love and his acceptance for the sinner. Yet he also said, the word that I have spoken will judge him. So there he expresses the inescapable consequences of rejecting Jesus, which we know is is hell. Um, And then he says, I have not spoken on my own authority. So finally, then Jesus stresses his submission to God the Father. So he kind of stresses those main points of him being God needing you need him and without him you're going to hell it's basically the gospel he's he's, he's stressing those last things because this is his last speech to the to the public so yeah very interesting a few uh points in there that are just my own thoughts and feel free to to um to pray about them and to come to your own conclusion on them um but i just thought it was such an interesting interesting passage we can get so much out of um and so many different arrivals on uh, which side of the fence you guys might be on um, and if you are, please comment, uh, leave a message down there. Give me an email, give me a message, whatever you want. Just get in contact. I'm not sure who watches these John videos anymore. It might be the youth. It might be some of the youth. It might be some of the adults. It might be all the adults. No youth. I don't know. But um, I really enjoy doing them, and I hope they bless you. And uh, we'll be there for John 13 next week. Um, sorry I missed last week's John video as well. It's so busy. But um, we'll be back on it every week now. So, yeah, see you soon, guys. Have a blessed week.